Small microcontrollers such as the Atmel AVR series have been popular with professionals and hobbyists for decades. What they lack in speed, they make up for in low cost, low power consumption, and ease of use. That's exactly why I've chosen this ATtiny2313. But eventually we need to go from an idea that's in our head to a software program that runs inside the chip itself. That's exactly what we'll do today using a program called Atmel Studio 7. Before I go on, I should note that I'm not affiliated with Atmel or their parent company, Microchip Technology, but I have been using their devices for almost 20 years. As a side project, I'm working on a machine vision module. The module contains a custom circuit board, and the custom circuit board contains a Atmel AVR microcontroller. Among other things, the AVR needs to blink a green LED on the circuit board to indicate that it's running correctly, so for now, our objectives are simple. Download a copy of Atmel Studio 7, write a simple program in the C language to blink the LED, connect the device called a in-system programmer or an ISP to the custom circuit board, and finally upload our custom program to the Atmel microcontroller. I should note that technical walkthroughs like this one eventually become dated. This was recorded in 2020, so as things change, I'll try to come back and alter the description with newer information. Besides a laptop or desktop computer, you'll need an Atmel AVR microcontroller. Today the model I'm using is the ATtiny2313-20SU. However, this procedure will work on a lot of their other projects, including the Atmega 328P, which is used on Arduino modules. However, I should note that if your AVR microcontroller came from an Arduino or something similar, today's procedure will erase any data on that microcontroller. This would include the Arduino bootloader, and if you erase the bootloader on an Arduino, it won't work until you replace it. So instead, you probably want a blank microcontroller, like the kind you can buy online from an electronics distributor. Finally, you'll need a device from Microchip or Atmel called an in-system programmer. This in-system programmer, or ISP, will act sort of like a bridge between your computer and the microcontroller itself. It uses a USB cable on one end and six programming wires on the other end. Today I'll be using the AVR ISP Mark II. However, as of the year 2020, these are a little bit difficult to find, so you might want to look for a newer device. Luckily, the basics, including the six wires, are always the same. For software, I'm using Windows 10, and we're going to install a program called Atmel Studio 7. Atmel Studio is the official integrated development environment, or IDE. Finally, as with everything that you download off the internet, I highly recommend scanning everything with your favorite anti-malware tool. Before you start this installation, back up any data that you consider important. To download Atmel Studio 7, I navigate it to the official microchip webpage. In the description for this video, you can find a link to that webpage. You can also simply go to www.microchip.com and then search for Atmel Studio. Look for the downloads page. Today I'll install the web installer. This arrives as a .exe file, so after you scan it, go ahead and run the exe if it looks okay. Review the end user license agreement and the directory. When you're done, click next. You'll see an option to select among three architectures. The one you'll need for this video is called AVR 8-bit MCU. At minimum, you should download that one, but I'll be installing all three. Click Next. You'll be asked about the Atmel software framework and related projects. This is optional, but if you plan on doing a lot of work with AVRs and other Atmel products, I recommend downloading it. Click Next and the installer will check for any conditions that might interfere with the installation. This includes Windows updates that are still in progress. If you see a problem listed, you'll need to resolve it before you can go on. But if you see nothing but check marks, you're okay to proceed. Finally, the system will show you any tips or suggestions that might help later on. Click Next and the installation will begin. You should monitor your computer in case Windows or the installer asks you about permissions. Also, because Atmel Studio is based on the Microsoft Visual Studio isolated shell, you're going to see Visual Studio also being installed. However, it's a free installation and you won't even need a Microsoft account for it. When installation is complete, make sure to launch Atmel Studio 7 is checked, and then click Close. Now it's time to actually run Atmel Studio 7. Click the New Project option on the left side. You can also start by navigating to File, New Project. First you'll need to select a programming language. For this, I make sure that C is selected in the top left corner. 
and then select GCC C Executable Project. Before you click OK, you might want to rename your project to something else, but because this is a simple test only, I will use the default name of GCC Application 1. I also recommend making sure that Create Directory for Solution is also checked, then click OK. Next, you'll be asked to select your exact Atmel device. In my case, I'm using the ATtiny 2313-20SU. I should select ATtiny 2313, but not ATtiny 2313A. The two are close, but not the same. It's a long list, so you might want to use the search filter in the top right corner. When you've selected it, click Next. Now Atmel Studio will create your project directory. Projects are also called solutions in this program and you'll see a basic version of a main.c program. From here, we can start coding in the C programming language. So now would be a good time to review a simplified schematic of that custom circuit board. The only parts that really matter today have been printed on the screen. The microcontroller, which is the largest feature on the schematic, has a 6-pin ISP connector. This connector lets me reprogram it, even though I've already hand-soldered the chip onto the circuit board. To let me see that the software on the chip is running, I've included a green LED. This LED is located next to other green LEDs on the board, so we need to make it flash. That LED is wired up to port B, pin 4, and in my program, I'm going to name that pin output run ID. A name like this will help remind me that it's an output and it's a run indicator. So now it's time to start coding. First, anytime you see two slashes, that indicates a comment, and comments are just our own notes, and they're not going to be read by the chip itself. First, let's start by defining that pin that's attached to the LED. Again, the name will be output run ID. Optionally, I'm also going to include a comment that just describes how that signal works. Next, we need to take that pin and define it as an output rather than an input, which is the default setting. To do that, I'm writing to data direction register B, or DDRB. This is an 8-bit value, and any bit that's a 1 will wind up being an output. Next, to actually activate that output, I need to use the port B register. This register is another 8-bit value, and any bit that's set to a 1 will activate that pin, giving us usually 3 to 5 volts, depending on the power supply. To turn the LED off, I simply write a 0 to that exact same pin. Next, we need to slow down the on-off blink rate. We'll do this by adding delays, otherwise the LED would just seem to be on constantly but slightly dimmer than normal. To generate that delay, we'll use the delay MS function, which is short for delay milliseconds. Being on for 500 milliseconds and off for 500 milliseconds will give us a 1 hertz blink rate, or something very close. Finally, in order to use delay ms, we need to include another header file that's not included by default, and use it to include delay.h. To generate an accurate delay, or one that's close, we also need to tell delay.h what our frequency is for the microcontroller. The ATtiny2313 includes an internal 8 MHz clock source. By default, this clock source goes through a divide by 8 function, so the final frequency will be 1 MHz. My custom circuit board has a faster clock on it, but for now, we only need the 1 MHz. So we'll define the CPU frequency, or FCPU, in Hertz. To avoid a compiler warning, we'll need to define this as an unsigned long, or a UL. After that's done, we'll review the code, save everything, and then navigate to build, 
build solution. If you run into any trouble, you can also get a copy of this code on our website using the link in the description below. If everything was okay, you should see the message build succeeded. If not, follow any on-screen instructions and this should show you where the error is. Now that the programming is done, we need to connect everything to the ISP programmer. This includes the USB cable going to the laptop and the six ISP wires that go to the microcontroller. Atmel and Microchip use a standard 6-pin and 10-pin connector for this purpose. If you have trouble figuring out which pin is pin 1, you can often look for a triangle or a red wire. These will show you where pin 1 is located, so be sure to double check everything. Finally, you'll need to supply your microcontroller with a power supply. In the past, the ISP programmer would supply this power by itself, but this seems to be a lot less common today. In my case, the custom circuit board has its own 5 volt regulator, so all I have to do is plug it in. With the coding and the wiring done, it's time to upload the program. Back in Atmel Studio, access device and debugger toolbar options. By default, this is usually a hammer shaped icon near the top, and if this is the first time you're using Atmel Studio, it will probably say None On. Click it, and you should see the following window. First, you want to select your ISP device. If it's not listed, double check your USB connection and then restart Atmel Studio. Second, select your interface as ISP. Third, you'll probably want to have the following settings. Set your ISP clock to 125 kHz or lower. Set programming settings equal to erase entire chip. And make sure there are check marks next to preserve erasable EEPROM, keep timers running in stop mode, and cache all memory. That last one should be blank. When you're done, click main.c and this will return you back to your own source code. From here, you can upload the code to the device by clicking the play button. Give it a few seconds to upload and you should see the LEDs start blinking. If you're seeing an error at this point, you can troubleshoot things by going to Tools, Device Programming. This will launch the Device Programming dialog. Make sure that your ISP tool is visible. At the very minimum, you want to make sure that you can click the Apply button without seeing an error. This means that your own computer is able to see the ISP programming device properly. Next, you want to make sure that you can click read for device signature and also read for device target voltage. If your target voltage is zero, it means either your system isn't powered on or you might have a problem with your wiring. My system needs to have 2.7 to about 5 volts, but other Atmel devices might require different voltage ranges. If you can see the code for your device signature, that's a really good sign and probably a sign that you can now upload your code. The launch failure message can also help you narrow down which signals are working and which ones aren't. And that's pretty much it. This machine vision project is part of an ongoing summer project. If you find this sort of thing useful, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And consider joining us on Patreon where we have a monthly poll and lessons learned with technical builds like this one. Stay tuned for more videos on electronics, robotics, and IoT, and as always, have a great day.